Welcome to Speaking Candidly with Candace, where we talk in depth with everyday people about their fears, their struggles, and their triumphs. I'm your host, Candace Schoner, and I hope over the next half hour you'll be engaged, enlightened, and inspired to live your best life. My guest today is Tuan Nguyen. Tuan is the owner of Seville Coffee in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he is the co-founder of the Community Investment Collaborative. I, he is also a social entrepreneur, and I want to welcome Tuan to the show. Welcome, Tuan. Thank you, Kenneth. Thanks for having me here. What a great honor. Well, I, I appreciate it, and it's my honor because you have done so much for the community and helping lift people out of poverty. And as an entrepreneur, um, you've just done so many different things, and uh, so we have lots to talk about. My first question is, did you know you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? No, I did not. You know, um, I, I went to architecture school uh, to be an architect, and then I went to business school, the uh, Darn Business School, to be in a big corporation. And so my vision for myself as an entrepreneur did not exist till, till I was in the corporate world. And then I realized the price that uh, one has to pay or I have to pay to be successful in the corporate world. And that's when I decided this is not, this is not worth it. And you seem to pay it forward with your success. Um, tell us a little bit more about the Community Investment Collaborative, or CIC. Well, to me, you know, uh, so as, as you just learned, entrepreneurship came a little later to me. And that's when you realize how precious it is, how powerful entrepreneurship is. Uh, and the price I have to pay for being in the corporate world is your time. You are not in control of your time. That is the, the thing I didn't realize and the thing I realized very quickly. And, and it's, it's brutal on your family, you know. Um, and it was, you know, while I was in the corporate world, it was very sexy. I, we live in Paris, and uh, the whole family lived in Paris where I was with United Technologies. And, you know, flew to everywhere, you know, Milan, Singapore, Tokyo, oh. um, I, Amsterdam. So it was a dream job in the sense that what do you imagine what a corporate world job would be, you know, um, very, very flashy. But then when, whenever, I, whenever I'm on that plane, I'm not with my family. Uh, and that's the price I realized that I didn't want to pay. And so, so uh, when we start, uh, so I got out of the corporate world because of that and uh, start doing um, our own st um, gig, being an entrepreneur. And then I realized how powerful it is that when you're uh, in control of your own destiny, you control your time. And also it's, it's like being an artist you are, ex you are uh, expressing to the world who you are, that, you know, your vision of the world. Speaking about the artist part, Sibo Coffee, which is your business that you've had for 20 years in Charlottesville, was not initially a coffee shop, right? That was not your intention. Actually, it was um, a furniture store uh, first. So as, as I was saying, uh, I have a degree in architecture, so I love to design and I love to create, um, you know, modify space. And so when we have that, um, the space where we're in right now, it was for a furniture store. And so I designed and make furniture there, like bookcases, tables, <clears throat> and you know, semi-custom stuff. And it was extremely successful also. Um, and then, so we opened that store in 2000. And guess what happened in 2001? 9-11. And then right. nobody was buying furniture because nobody know even if they are going to have a house or not. Right. Uh, it was a lot of fear, and so that business just tanked because of 9/11. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we had a 20-year lease in that space, mm. so we had another 19 years on the hook with that space. So we have to re reinvent ourselves. And so we turn into a coffee shop. Well, good for you for reinventing yourself because it's been very successful. There, I know that there have been some years that there's been some challenges, but I know the story about how it became Sivo Coffee. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? So yes, um, so we, like I said, we have that huge space and it's like 3,500 square feet, which is huge for, you know, you wouldn't want to do that 
uh, start out as a coffee shop, <clears throat> but we have just a little room in the front uh, that 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 was not used. And my daughter, who was eight at the time, uh, thought it was a great idea to make it into a little coffee shop, so that way people can come in and buy a two dollar cup of coffee, and then sit our, at the tables that we designed and made, and look at the you know the bookcase and all that. So for her, it was like just a great marketing ploy it was. to get people in. Uh, and so we thought, great, you know, what a great idea. So we turned that little room into a coffee shop first. Um, but we did not, that was not like the main business. The main business was the furniture part. Well, I know you said family is very important to you, and you talked about your family and leaving the corporate world to spend more time with your family. Am I correct that your wife did some of the baking initially, and maybe she still does? Uh, initially, she did uh, all of the baking, uh, and now we have grown so much that uh, she, she doesn't do it. She offloads to us, uh, and she does uh, a little bit of it, yes. I want to go back, because I don't know the way you actually answered the question about what is CIC and what you're doing there. So uh, CIC is um, a nonprofit that helps people with a vision and uh, with a lot of energy, because that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur is a lot of energy, uh, to start their own business. And it's a way to become self-sufficient. And my, I, I came up with the idea after um, hearing the story about Vinegar Hill. Um, this is like 10 years ago when <coughs> Charlene Green did um, um, <clears throat> Dialogue on race. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember dialogue. Sure. On and it was it was about you know bringing out into open to the community discussion about what happened, and that's when I learned of, of, of the whole Vinegar Hill story, where uh, whole communities get 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 um, swept aside. A lot of businesses swept aside. It was a thriving hub, and so hearing about that, you know, it's like. Like, like most people, it's like just incredible. So I thought, you know, what can be done about that? How do we remedy a wrong? And so, you know, and obviously, you know, people have been helped with it, you know, giving. But to me, that's that's not the answer. The answer is how to restore economic self-sufficiency and pride. Because when you earn your own money, when you grow your own business, that's human dignity, and that cannot be given. It has to be earned. But a lot of people who who are in in you know in social help, social welfare, do not have the capital to start a business, do not have the connection, and do not have the education to start a business. And so that's when I thought that you know in this town we have so much, we have so much wealth, we have so much heart. We have so much knowledge. If we can bring it all together through a program, then we can provide that. And, uh, and that's when, when I started CIC. Do you remember your first success story with CIC? Yes, um, uh, Charles Child was um, in our first class and he, he was living in Crescent Hall. <laughs> he didn't have a job, never went to college. Uh, he was 37 at that time. And he um, he had an idea. He's saying, you know, I want to start a, a taxi business. Oh, and also he was in a wheelchair. So I say, yeah, you know, he came to the class with this dream, and I say, what uh, what make you? Because I always love to hear why people want to do something because there must be passion, and something must have sparked that passion. Right. And I always love to hear the story background about, uh, behind that. Well, so Charles. Uh, live at Crescent Hall, as you know, it's a high rise, and he has to go to a doctor. So every time he calls a taxi, a taxi would come, <clears throat> and the taxi would uh, drive up and see here's a, a man in a no wheelchair. wheelchair. And so most of the time, I say, you know, I don't want to go through the trouble of getting out, taking the wheelchair, and putting it in the trunk, put him in, and do it all over again. And, and Crescent Hall is near the, the downtown mall, so I say, well, forget that. I'm just going to go pick up a tourist. It's much, so much easier. So most of the time, the taxi driver would just leave him there. And so he would say, you know, wow. instead of getting angry, he's saying, wow, if this happens to me, it must happen to every uh, you know, Other handicapped person in people. Situation. So sure. he wanted to start a, a business. And so he did. So through CIC, we funded him to, he has a car, 
to convert into a handicap accessible. Uh, we, we, we help him with the pricing, we help him with promotion. And he, he, a year later, he moved out of Crescent Hall and have his own apartment. That has got to make all the people involved, including yourself, feel so proud of what you've done for this, this man. Oh, yeah. You've and, changed his life. And then, you know, it's talking about generation change also. So here he, he was dependent on the welfare system. Right. And now he's out of it. And he, at that time, he had a 16-year-old son. Boy, his son was so proud of him, you know, to see his father uh, have a, a, a dream and then went after it and become successful. But there's not going to be all... Charles stories, there's gonna be some stories of people who've tried to start a business who, and have failed. Oh yes, but you know, it's a journey, isn't it? I mean, life is, is journey. We, I don't see as failure, I, I see everything as self-discovery. And I'll tell you um, a story, there's this man, uh, his first name is Wade, and he's like a 56 year old man mm -hmm. who for some reason, and I still never knew why, but he has this dream of opening a coffee shop. And I would ask him, you know, why would you? And he'd say, no, I just have this idea. And he'd been at it for like five years. And he would go to SCORE with his business plan. And SCORE is a wonderful organization. I mean, you know, SCORE is an organization of retired executives who help people start their own business. Uh, and he would go to them with his business plan. And they would say, you know, wait, this is not going to work because... So, 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 so. And he wouldn't believe them because he, he thought, you know, you just don't have faith in me. Hmm. Right? And so he went through, he was the same class as Charles, the first one. Um, and one of the classes, we have something called uh, break even analysis. And we sat down, we have to say, okay, how many cups of coffee do you have to sell in a day to break even for the rent, for the insurance, for the labor, for the stir, for the cream, for the everything. And I let him do it. And I remember we sat in, in at Siebel Coffee and I would point out to him every, all the costs. And I wouldn't help him. I would just say, you know, you do. So anyway, make a long story short, at the end of the, of the class, he saw for himself that it would not work. Nobody told him that it wouldn't work. He That's... saw for himself. But that was liberating to him. Absolutely. I mean, you know, before he, he has this like this, this, this burden on his shoulder. He walks around with it. After that, he was like, my God, I am so glad I'm free of that yeah. burden anymore. He, he, no, no, he got, after that, he got a job as a security guard, and he's so happy. Do you ever watch the show Shark Tank? Uh, I've seen bits Clips and pieces of it. So you're familiar of, yeah, yeah. with uh -huh. the concept. Yep, yep, yep. It kind of sounds like the local Shark Tank without having to go on TV and air all your financial and personal information and have people decide for you whether it's worth the investment or not. Yeah, uh, to me, this is uh, so much more powerful because this has come from you. And, exactly. And, and you have to do all the, the thinking, the, the digging. We don't, we, we're not in the position to say, this is good business or not, I have no idea. When I start uh, Cibo Coffee, all our friends say, you're crazy. There's no way you're gonna make it. This is absolutely a crazy idea. So, and that's, that's, that's the hard part of being an entrepreneur is to see something that no one else see, isn't it? But it's also dedication, right? I mean, you can't go into something without planning to invest many, many hours way more than a regular job sure, sure. And, and not to quit too soon, right, quit right. too early. Right. Um, you mentioned that you know, Seville Coffee, there were some struggles. I think in 2007, there was some construction going on. Well, it was, uh, first, first of all, there was the recession. So it was, to me, it was a one-two punch. First, there was a recession uh, of, um, when, when was it, 2009? It was 2008. 2008, 2009, which, you know, wow. It was a whopper. Uh, and coffee is the first thing that people stop because in every money management show they say cut out the latte <laughs> every time because they say if you if you count how much money you spend on that latte it's going to add up and so people cut that out first so we lost like 25 percent of our business boom just wow. like that 
you know, and rightly so, it was a deep recession after the uh, subprime uh, bust. But, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is, is like you say, dedication. You, you're not just going to fall. You have to find a way out. And, and then I believe the old adage, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. I agree. So in 2009 was when uh, the recession happened. So we said, we said, what can we do to offset that? So we have music. So that's in 2010, right. we brought on our music, which is now, you know, we're the home for the Prism Coffee House now. So the music part has been extremely successful. So that made us stronger, right? And so that was 2009. And then, so we got over that. We thought, oh, shoo, wait a minute. And then I think 2013, 12, 13 was when the construction of the 250 bypass, you know, Meadowbrook Parkway. And that was harder on us than the construction because uh, it was during the daytime mm -hmm. and they work, you know, eight to five, just like a banker. Uh, and, uh, you remember the Rio Road construction, they worked at night. And so during the day, there was no, no traffic uh, jam. Well, for, uh, <clears throat> for us, it was like 30 minutes traffic jam either way. And some days you can't even get into our uh, complex. Right. So, and it went on for three years. So uh, what we did was we went into catering because they, if they don't come to us, we have to go to them. Right. And, and that has become an extremely successful business. So I see that we have two businesses, uh, a retail, which is Cebu Coffee, and the catering business, which is very, very profitable now. So out of the hard, you know, hardship came something good. And that's a really positive way to look at it. Um, when you were growing up, um, who were some of your inspirations? Um, you know, it was, it was a political, my, my inspiration was really Ho Chi Minh. Because here's a man who uh, dedicated his life for his country. He did not get rich. I mean, a lot of people who found country, I think, got rich. You know, he never, never got rich. In fact, uh, uh, I haven't been to it, but um, I hope to, to go to his house, which is just a little hut. You know, very, very simple. Um, and the story, it was... Um, he was uh, working at the Ritz Carlton in, in, uh, in the 20s in, in London. And London was like, you know, that's the center of the world back then. And he has a chance to uh, be a sous chef for Escoffier, which is just famous, you know, world renowned. People still uh, know him, this French chef. Um, and the story is that every, every night, and Ho Chi Minh was a dishwasher, and every night he would. Uh, put scraps away, you know, people didn't finish, they put scrap. And the Scofier noticed that, and he went up to Ho Chi Minh and said, didn't we feed you? We, the, you know, the, the traditional thing is you have a, a dinner, uh, employee's meal before the shift. And he said, didn't, didn't you get enough? And he said, no, this is not for me, this is for the, uh, the homeless of London. Now, this is 1920, now we have, you know, social consciousness that, to help, you know, there's the haven right down the street to help the homeless. But back then, it was dog eat dog. I mean, there was no one to help anybody in 1920. So he was sort of the first social entrepreneur, maybe. Yes, yes, he was. And so he said, <clears throat> after my shift, I go and, and give this out to the homeless of uh, London. And then Scopier was like so touched by that. He said, you know, I'm gonna make you my sous chef. And Ho Chi Minh said, no, that's okay, thank you. but. I have other plans. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great, great story. Yeah. And so what happened was uh, he said, okay, well, if you don't want to be a sous chef, I'd make you a, my pastry chef. And he did. So a, a little known fact in history, Ho Chi Minh was an accomplished pastry chef. Who knew? And that's how he traveled the world. I mean, if you, you read anything about Ho Chi Minh, I mean, he was in Chicago, he was in Paris, he was everywhere. And here's this man who doesn't have a penny, how do you travel? Right. Well, he went work on cruise ship as pastry chef. If you weren't an entrepreneur and you were anything else, what else would you want to do? So my, my, my original dream, like I say, I once I studied architecture and I uh, got my MBA, was to go back to Vietnam and help rebuild Vietnam. And that's why I studied architecture is that, you know, after the war, everything was devastated. So how do you go back and help? And so that was my original dream, was to do that. 
my father was a diplomat, my grandfather was a diplomat. And so it was instill in us that you have to help your country. And that's why Ho Chi Minh was my, my hero. Yeah. You started another venture here in Charlottesville, um, Seville Central. Mm -hmm. And we went back and you talked about the construction that almost put you out of business at Seville Coffee. It also affected that venture. Can you tell me or tell our audiences a little bit about that venture and what the plan was? Because I thought it was brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, you know, I have to credit my, my wife for Seville Central because <clears throat> so CIC was going very well. So it helped people get started. Uh, and she said, well, it's really nice to help people start it. But the hardest thing about a business is to get a client. And so how do you help them with that? Because as you know, anybody can sign a piece of paper, do an incorporation, say, hey, I'm in business. Now, are you going to be successful? That's a second uh, step to that. And so, you know, I say, no, you're absolutely right. Because the hardest thing for an entrepreneur uh, is to get business. So like, like, um, like we have this man, his name is Terry. He's a painter, a fantastic painter. But he has a, he went through our program. Uh, and he has a very hard time finding people because your house is your castle. You going to want someone who's accountable, who knows quality, who is trustworthy. And a single person is going to, is going to be hard to represent that. So we came up with the concept of Civil Central where we're the front. We're like the person you're going to talk to. And then we sub it out to, uh, you know, uh, small businesses. And that went extremely well. We, we did it for two years. Uh, and we got so much job for a landscaper, for a uh, handyman, for, because people just trust me. They say, right. uh, I, know, I know you. Right. I know where you live. <laughs> right down the, you know, Seville Coffee, if there's a problem, I'm going to come. And I know that you know what quality is. And I trust you. So you, I'm held accountable for everything. And, and they, people love to help small business. Absolutely. Yet no, no doubt we, if it, whether you, if you go, if you have a choice between a big company and a small local person, people will definitely choose the local because they, they know it, they get it. But the problem of accountability is, is, is the issue. And did you vet all of the people? Oh yeah, that? absolutely. In fact, the first three of our subcontractor was CIC graduate. Mm -hmm. So, so, I know them because I work with them for three months. The program is three months, so I, I got to know them extremely well, and they understand how we work also. So yes, we vet them for quality. We vet them for on timeness. We vet them for uh, pricing also, because we want to make it you know very very uh, fair. What would you say is would be the? I know this is a very difficult question. The number one quality in a person to start a business and to be successful? I would say, you know, passion for what you do because you have to be very good with that. So when, when you sit down with me, let's say uh, you you like to hire me for something, you want to see, or do you have the passion for that? Because with passion comes excellence, right? With passion comes, I don't care what it takes to make this job, but it's going to be done right because because you're holding your vision of yourself as a standard, not you know, right. what I can get away with, right? So, so that is the most important. And then secondly is, is reputation. Uh, and ex for example, one of the biggest problems we have with people hiring small business uh, as like in contracting uh, is uh, if, if John hires Terry, the painter, you know, and do his outside, and which he did, there was a John that, um, it's with ten thousand dollars. So the, the the norm is I give you three thousand to buy material. That's like the down payment for the job. So many times that person gets three thousand dollars and disappear. Because if you're a small guy, who are you gonna call? Right. There's nobody nobody to call. So so that trustworthy is very, very important. Well and that is a challenge for small businesses, particularly in the home improvement field. Mm -hmm. Because typically they don't have the cash up front right. to pay for the materials. 
And so you have to do some vetting on your own. I just actually had a fence built and went through the similar thing. And I love hiring local people. I love supporting our local community. Um, so it's, it's good to have things like Angie's List or companies sure. like Central, Seville Central, people that have already done the vetting for individuals. Um, tell me about, you know, we talked a lot about your successes, a, a few of the things, the challenges that you have overcome. Um, what do you think was your biggest challenge to overcome in your life, whether it be personal or business? Um, the hardest thing was, was, was the corporation. And like I say, you know, I spent uh, so much time getting to there. I mean, it was a long journey to get into Darwin Business School. It's not easy. And then go through the business school. And then I spent four years um, in, in the corporation. So I invested, you know, 10 years or so. To, to, and to walk away from that was very, very hard. And, but the, and what, what, what really, because my vision was to go back to Vietnam and be like my father, help Vietnam, like my, like my grandfather. So it was a family legacy. And, and it, was, it was causing problem at home because I was not there. And I was not there for my daughter at the time. Uh, and, and there was, a, I remember a critical moment. We were in Paris. And the next jump, I would be in Vietnam, be country manager for uh, carrier air conditioning um, for, for, for United Technology. So my, you know, my wife wanted to go back to Charlottesville to uh, raise her family, and I wanted to go. And then um, my wife, you know, finally, so we have an argument, and she, and, and she finally said, Tuan, whose life is it you're living? Your father's life or your life? And it's like a cold splash really? on my head. It's like, really? you're absolutely right. Uh, I was living my father's life. But, you know, I started CIBL, uh, CIC, the Community Investment Collaborative, because after hearing the Vernon Hill story, I realized that Charlottesville is my Vietnam. I don't wow. have to go back to it. Wow. I don't have to go to Vietnam to do to help people. I can be right here and help my own community. And that is the note that I want to end on because I think that's why I wanted you to be on the show. So inspiring your whole philosophy and what you have done for the community and helping the people out of poverty. I thank you for speaking candidly with me. And to everybody out there, please remember, every cloud has a silver lining. Until next time, this is Candace with Speaking Candidly with Candace.